everyone. Today we're going to talk about extremophiles or those microscopic organisms that live in environments that are so extreme that humans couldn't survive. And it kind of begs the question, what does normal mean anyway? We think of our environment as being normal, but organisms that live in extreme environments have adapted to that environment. So for them, it's normal. If I asked you to think of what is one of the most important things aside from food and water that you need to be comfortable, you would probably say a nice stable temperature. And that's true for all forms of life. All life forms, whether a bacteria, an archaea, a eukaryote, have a range of temperatures in which they can survive. There's an upper end where it gets too hot and past that temperature you won't survive. And then of course there's a lower end where it's too cold and past that temperature you'll freeze. Somewhere in the middle of that temperature range is what we call the optimum temperature. And as you've probably already guessed, that means the fine range at which an organism grows fastest or best. We humans fall into a category called the mesophiles. We can survive on our own in a pretty wide range of temperature. So in Celsius, that's from about 10 degrees Celsius up to about 50 degrees Celsius. Room temperature is generally somewhere around 25. 50 degrees Celsius is well into the hundreds in Fahrenheit. But our optimum temperature is right around 35 to 40 degrees. 37 degrees Celsius is body temperature. That's about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is our optimum temperature range. This is how we grow the best and how we flourish the most. However, many organisms can grow in conditions too hot for us. And we call those something like thermophiles or even extreme thermophiles. These tend to start growing right when we've gotten past the human's maximum temperature, around 45 or so degrees Celsius. And we kind of have two classes, one that can grow up to about 80 degrees Celsius and the other that can grow all the way up to about 130 degrees Celsius. So the thermo, meaning heat, Thermophiles are heat-loving bacteria, and extreme thermophiles like it incredibly hot. Think of bacteria that are found in hot springs, that can survive in hot springs and geysers, or those that live down at the bottom of the ocean near the hydrothermic vents. Those bacteria and archaea have adapted to live in that particularly hot environment so that their enzymes function, their cell walls and cell membranes don't fall apart in those conditions. On the other end of the spectrum, we have those that grow in conditions that we would consider too cold. We call these psychrophiles or psychrotrophs. The psychrotrophs overlap with us a bit, so from about 35 degrees Celsius down to 5 degrees Celsius, whereas the psychrophiles can grow at temperatures that are right around freezing and continue growing all the way down to well below freezing, a temperature at which our processes would stop working. So psychrophiles and psychrotrophs grow where it's very, very cold. These would be the kind of bacteria or archaea that could cause food spoilage even in your fridge. And they're the type of organisms that we would expect to find when we take samples of things like Arctic and Antarctic ice. There's an entire field of microbiology that's grown up around the study of bacteria that can survive at very cold temperatures, and it's called astrobiology. And astrobiologists think that by studying these organisms that live at extreme temperatures, we can have an idea of what life might look like on other planets where it's colder than our life can survive or hotter than where our life can survive. Now you may be thinking, lots of things can survive where it's hot, lots of things can survive where it's cold. And that is true, but those very, very extreme temperatures are pretty much only inhabited by archaea and bacteria. The table here is showing us the upper temperature limits for a number of types of organisms. Animals like fish and other aquatic vertebrates, their upper limit is about 38 degrees Celsius, so even lower than our upper limit. Insects, they can survive to where it's pretty hot. Crustaceans can survive to where it's pretty hot, but nowhere near as hot as the thermophiles. Remember, this is the starting point at which thermophiles can really thrive. 
Some plants can survive in fairly hot temperatures, one up to 60 degrees Celsius, but most around 45 to 50, which is the same as the human upper end. Moving just a little bit hotter are our microorganisms. So the eukaryotic microorganisms can survive to slightly above temperatures that we can, but the clear winner in the heat war are the prokaryotes. Many photosynthetic bacteria can live well into the 70 degrees Celsius range, which is about 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And some non-photosynthetic bacteria can get up to 95 degrees Celsius, which is about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And some archaea can handle such hot temperatures that are roughly 250 degrees Fahrenheit. The picture is showing us the growth of some algae along a hot spring. The algae is green in the middle and you can see where it's bordering the water of the hot spring. I'm tracing it with the green color here. Where it is close to this hot spring, we see a lot of algal growth, but the V line here points out where it is now too cold for those algae to grow. Here where there's some ground, that ground is too cold and the temperature range is so fine that you can make out a very nice demarcation between algal growth on one side and loss of growth on the other side where it's simply too cold. A second condition, and one that we might not think about as much, is that in order for an organism to grow optimally, they need to be in the correct pH, or they need to be able to maintain their pH within some window. Humans keep our bodies at a neutral pH, generally ranging from about five to 7.7 .7 or eight. If our body becomes too acidic or too alkaline, we get very, very sick. But some organisms have again evolved to live in very extreme pH. Microorganisms have been isolated from a number of sites of varying pH. And I'm just gonna point a few out for you here. Some bacteria and archaea have been isolated from volcanic soils which is up here with a pH of about one. We also know that some can survive in gastric fluids within our stomach acid. There's actually a very famous bacteria that can do this. It's called Helicobacter pylori, and it causes stomach ulcers. Of course, you know that bacteria can survive on things like tomatoes and cheese and cabbage, and those all cause food spoilage. That's not too surprising because that pH, while somewhat acidic, isn't incredibly acidic. We eat those foods without any uh, deleterious effects to ourselves. Way down on the alkaline end of things, of course there are bacteria that can survive in seawater. Seawater is one of the richest sources of microbial life on Earth, but seawater is not horribly alkaline. It's right around a pH of eight. We can swim in the ocean, it doesn't hurt our bodies. More alkaline things such as soap solutions or ammonia, we would not be able to survive in them. They actually will hurt our skin if we leave them on for long enough, but there are some bacteria and a lot of archaea that can grow in these conditions as well. In fact, we know that soap, while we generally think of it as something that can't be contaminated, that can't allow for the outgrowth of bacteria, there are a number of bacteria from the genus Pseudomonas that can grow in soap just well. Some pseudomonads can also grow in ammonia. So while we as humans need our pH to be neutral in order to survive and be optimal, these microbes that live at extreme environments need their environment to be extreme. If we take them from this very alkaline pH or this very acidic pH and we move them to a neutral pH, they will die. They cannot survive because they're not adapted for our neutral pH. A few examples, E. coli, Escherichia coli. Remember, this can be either a human pathogen, but there is a lot of E. coli that lives in our gut as a commensal bacteria and helps us digest our food. So it makes sense that it would survive at a pH similar to our own. Of the acidophiles, we have some that can grow all the way down in a pH of one, a lot more that can grow at pHs of between three to five to six. The image down here is showing a volcano with its volcanic ash that is extremely acidic. But we have managed to recover a variety of microorganisms that survive in these conditions. And not just survive, they thrive. They grow there very, very well. On the more alkaline end, again, we have a range of pH from the close to neutral eight all the way down to about 10, where bacteria and microorganisms can thrive. Now, if I had asked you to make a list of what sort of conditions would be optimal for you to grow, you probably would have said temperature and you probably would have said pH. What you might not have thought about is the right salt concentration or the right water activity. 
And these two last classes, salt concentration and water activity, are actually very important to single-celled organisms like bacteria, like archaea, and even like some of our protists. Organisms that can grow in very high salt concentrations are called halophiles. Halo meaning salt. Again, like with temperature, like with pH, there are ranges of salt in which particular organisms can grow, with there being a low end and a high end. We humans, because we don't like a whole lot of salt, are called non-halophiles. We are way down here, almost not even on the graph, in the same place as, for instance, E. coli. There are what we call the halo-tolerant bacteria in archaea, and as the word tolerant in here suggests, they can handle a higher salt concentration, but not an extreme salt concentration. Whereas our optimal salt concentration is somewhere less than one, these halo-tolerant bacteria can survive in salt concentrations up to about 10% salt in their medium, in their solution. They grow best somewhere around four or 5%. And a prime example of this is the bacteria Staphylococcus aureus. And then of course we have what are called the halophiles, and the extreme halophiles. As you can guess with that root of file there, these are the salt-loving bacteria, the salt-loving archaea. They need a very high concentration of salt to grow optimally. Allovibrio fischeri is actually a seawater bacteria. So of course it makes sense that it would grow optimally. It would be evolved and adapted to an environment that has a relatively high level of salt. All right, we just defined halophiles as being organisms that grow in high salt concentrations. There are also organisms that we call osmophile. Like with salt, these also grow in higher solute concentration, but this is generally sugar. And the final category of organisms that grow in very low water concentrations are called xerophiles. These can grow and reproduce in conditions with very little water. There's a term called water activity that describes how much water is in a particular environment. A water activity of one is pure water, just growing on in the water. And of course, there are a number of organisms that can live in pure water, as long as it has some nutrients that they can absorb from their environment. Human blood has a slightly lower water activity, of course, because our blood is packed full of things like glucose and cells and nutrients and ions that are important in keeping us alive. But like you guys have always learned, so much of our body is made up of water. Seawater, again, mostly a liquid, just slightly below blood even. There are a number of bacteria like Allovibrio fischeri that can grow in seawater just fine. Now these osmophiles that can grow in high sugar concentrations, they can grow in things like syrup. They can grow in things like fruit cakes, jams, and jellies, things that you have no doubt seen food spoilage on before. And these are gonna be caused typically by gram-positive cocci, such as Staphylococcus, or by yeasts and molds. So Saccharomyces is a type of yeast, and then penicillin is a fungus. Recall that xerophiles grow where there is very little water present. They grow on things that we don't normally think of as having microbial life. Think about dry food in your pantry that doesn't spoil very much. Things like cereal, dried candy like peppermints, and dried fruit. Although these foods don't spoil readily, like ham, fruit cakes, jams can if they're not refrigerated, these dry goods can support microbial life. There are a number of fungi that can grow on these, and a few archaeal and bacterial species that can grow on these as well. We couldn't survive in this sort of environment because we need so much more water. But these organisms have, again, adapted to this environment and can grow in these very, very low water concentrations and these very high salt or very high sugar concentrations. Okay, so a quick recap. Extremophiles are organisms that can live and enjoy life at very extreme conditions. We talked about temperature and the need for a specific temperature range that will allow a cell to function optimally and not fall apart. pH, or how acidic or basic an environment can be and support life of different types of organisms. And those organisms that can survive either in high solute or very low water concentrations. So the halophiles that grew in an abundance of salt, the osmophiles that grew where there is a high amount of sugar, and the xerophiles that grow where there is little to almost no water available in their environment. So that's a brief tour of the extremophiles, many of which are bacteria, a lot of which tend to be archaea.